For Adam, one man, sin came to the world, Jesus, obedience, many became righteous. So your argumentation that Adam is mythological and is symbolic of humanity general falls to the ground in an exegesis of Romans chapter 5. So here is a director of the American Museum, H.F. Osborne, using evolution and is, is making unwittingly racist remarks about black people because the idea of the survival of the fittest, people have developed higher than other, other, other groups. You're not saving the church, you're not helping the church, you're actually endangering the church because you're having a lot of influence at the moment. And this video is a public, gentle, but clear, unequivocal rebuke and challenge to you, brother, that what you're teaching in this area is theologically dangerous and disastrous. So, Bob, this is an open challenge to you, brother, uh, to answer some of these questions and challenges that uh, I, I want to put to you. And uh, I hope that uh, you might take up the challenge and make a video response to what I have to say, because what I have to say is very important and uh, you need to put some butter on the bread in order to make your claims that you've made about theistic evolution, uh, you need to actually give us some detailed evidence in order for your proposition uh, about theistic evolution to be correct. So there was a debate between uh, Bob the Builder in Speaker's Corner, Hyde Park, not so long ago, between a young gentleman and then a lady chipped in. And, and basically Bob's position is... The Old Testament narratives, when they go back far enough, it's where myth and history become infused. When it starts to become real history, then it is around the time of Abraham. But let's also bear in mind this. What does Adam mean? The first Adam. No, it doesn't. It means man, sorry. Adam Adwama means, I don't know what it means, means mankind. Yeah, yeah. So when it says Adam, mm -hmm. you can either choose to read that as a proper pronoun, mm -hmm. i.e., sorry, as a proper noun, so the name of a person, mm -hmm. or you can read it as a statement about all of humanity. That this idea of reading Genesis literally and emphasizing the literal interpretation of Genesis is a modern thing. If you look at early Christian authors like Saint Augustine, like Oregon, like Irenaeus, mm -hmm. like Justinian. They don't emphasize the literal interpretation as being the preeminent interpretation. Mm -hmm. They emphasize the allegorical interpretation as being preeminent. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in evolution or science that contradicts what the Bible teaches, because the Bible is teaching theological points and the scientific inquiry is about the mechanics of the world. These are different questions. And I, I want to say uh, quite a lot about this issue. I think this issue is extremely important. So my first question to you, Bob, is do you understand the full implications on the doctrine of the fall of man? Uh, I recommend this book for people to get. It's called The Farce of Evolution. And uh, there's an interesting quote here by an atheist. Uh, G. Richard Bozarth says this, Christianity is, must be, totally committed to the special creation as described in Genesis. Christianity must fight with its full might, fair or foul, against the theory of evolution. It becomes clear now that the whole justification of Jesus' life death is predicated on the existence of Adam and the forbidden fruit he and Eve ate. Without the original sin, who needs to be redeemed? Without Adam's fall into a life of constant sin, terminated by death, what purpose is there to Christianity? None. What this all means is that Christianity cannot lose. The battle must be waged for Christianity is fighting for its very life. This is G. Richard Bossa. Now, I know what your response would be. Your response would be... Just, to, just like when we speak into the scientific paradigm, we speak differently today than people in the past. And this is why I don't believe that we have to worry about Genesis being seen as literal or not literal. The doctrine of the fall of man is predicated on a real Adam and a real Eve who really fell into sin and brought the catastrophe of a fallen world. I think this theological issue 
is something in all your argumentation about evolution and accepting evolution and, and saying that uh, the Genesis account is mythological, all your argument really is undermining a central key theological tenet in Christianity. And you like the early church fathers, you like uh, the Greek and Russian Orthodox Church theologically and whatever you. And uh, if you were to look into uh, the history of the doctrine of the fall of man, I'm sure that the Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church and the Protestant churches uh, all would say that the fall was a literal real fall, that sin came into the world through, through Adam. So I would ask, how do you answer Romans 5? Therefore, just as through one man said, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. For until the law, sin was not in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So your, your exegesis to say that Adam is plural takes away from the analogy in verse 14, Romans 5.14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to the transgression of Adam. It was a type of him who was to come. So Adam is a type of Christ. But the free gift is not like offense, for if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God, the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. So Adam, one man, sin came to the world, Jesus, obedience, many became righteous. So your argumentation that Adam is mythological and is symbolic of humanity general falls to the ground in an exegesis of Romans chapter 5. So that's my first challenge is the theological implications of evolution, denies the doctrine of sin. Even atheists see that as strategically catastrophic, catastrophic for Christianity, if you allow that to happen. Secondly, your exegesis of scripture, you're not dealing with clear passages of scripture that show that Adam is a real person and that uh, it, it was a real historical issue there that you're not dealing with. Secondly, uh, uh, thirdly, uh, I just want to go into this issue of um, the Bible is revelation to 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word inspiration means God breathed. So when Moses wrote, he breathed, it was breathed out. It was the revelation of God. So Genesis 1, 2 and 3 is the revelation of God. And in that revelation, he wrote Genesis 1, 2 and 3. And, he, and in that, he gives us a picture of creation as... A revelation from God is happening in six days. You're, you're, you're looking at it so culturally, the cultural prism of uh, the time of Moses coming out of Egypt, that you're forgetting the also the revelation. Now, I agree with you. We have to look at it culturally in, in the historical time frame of the passage of Scripture, no doubt about that. But you're missing the, the eternal revelation that in that cultural millennium of Moses, that God gave him a revelation, and you're missing that. And because you want to mold the text to your modern mindset, you're using this cultural argument and taking it far too much, too far, so that you negate the actual situation concerning the, that it is about six-day creation, that it is historical. Christianity is rooted in history. Christianity is different from any other religion in that the framework of Christianity is rooted in history. God creates, Adam came, Adam fell. Then you had Cain and Abel. Then you had Abraham. Then you have people like Moses. Then you had uh, the, the, the life of David. And it's historical. There's this history. The basic foundation of Christianity is, is it's historical. It's a, it's a history of redemption. It's a history of redemption. And, and, and because Christianity is history, it's true. It really is God made the world. It really is Adam fell. It really is Jesus lived. It really is Jesus died. It really is Jesus rose again. Not allegorical, it's historical. And because it's historical, it's true. Can you prove to us that the early church, and I'm talking from uh, 200 AD to say 600 AD, from 200 to 600 AD, can you tell us quite clearly that the early church was purely allegorical in its interpretation? And, and the early church 
fathers kind of camped on this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, these kind of passages, Justin Martyr, Origen, St. Augustine, many others, they kind of camped on this passage, kind of passages like this. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Moreover, brethren, I do want you to, uh, to, to be unaware that all your fathers were under the cloud as passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank the spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. Those passages is saying that in the Old Testament, Moses and the patriarchs and the people in the Old Testament, they knew about Christ. The prophecies, the, the tabernacle, the high priest, they knew that wasn't the reality, that that was the shadow pointing to the Messiah coming. When Abraham was promised that he would have a people like the stars in the sky, he knew that that wasn't the full promise, that it was going to come in the Messiah one day. Now, the early church fathers like Justin Martyr, Origen, Irenaeus, uh, St. Augustine, and the others, that's how they interpreted the Old Testament, that they, they saw it as pointing to Christ. They also, like Origen and St. Augustine, believed in the importance of the literal. They did believe in looking at the historical grammatical method. But with Origen and with, in particular, St. Augustine, they did have issues when it came to Genesis. And the problem there is, it's not the allegorical method, it's because they specifically had issues with Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. Because they, came, they, they were particularly grappling with philosophy. St. Augustine was a great philosopher as well as a theologian. And it didn't sit well with him with certain philosophies that he'd come out of. And he wanted it to have intellectual integrity. The same with Origen. He was a, a great mind and he had uh, influence by philosophy. And so the allegorical interpretation of Genesis helped them to have peace with the philosophical mindsets of his day, the day. It wasn't necessarily because they exegeted the passage in a correct way. In other words, there was philosophical cultural pressures on their interpretation of Genesis. There were two schools of thought in the early church. There was the Alexandrian school of interpretation and the Antioch interpretation. And I would put it to you, Bob, that you are misrepresenting to the Christian public that there was just this allegorical interpretation. You have to define what you mean by the allegorical interpretation. Yes, Justin Martyr and others believe that if you looked at the Old Testament, allegorically it spoke of Christ. Yes, okay? But then you have to break that down, and then when you come to Origen or St. Augustine on a particular text, like Genesis, you have to be specific and not general in understanding why they are saying what they're saying about Genesis. So my question there is, aren't you being too simplistic when you're trying to apply the allegorical method to Genesis, saying that the early church did that? No, it was more complex than you're actually saying. There was a general allegorical interpretation that Christ was in the Old Testament, but then there are some theologians such as Origen and St. Augustine that had problems with the literal interpretation of Genesis because they had philosophical influences coming at them and they wanted intellectual integrity and that's why they felt the pressure and the allegorical method was uh, a kind of convenient way of not dealing with the issue. You're, you're not representing the history of hermeneutics correctly. And so I challenge you to debunk what I've said, debunk everything that I've said there. On the issue of the literal and the allegorical, the, the Bible is a very simple but a very uh, complex book. And there is a basic rule of interpretation that you, you, that you use the simple scripture to interpret the difficult. So there are plain scriptures that we use to interpret the difficult, okay? So when it comes to the, uh, do we look at something allegorical or literal? Uh, there are some things that are important when it comes to history. And we look at the simple scriptures. So for example, if we're looking at, uh, at Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, we need to read Romans chapter 5. There's a very clear scripture that helps us to interpret Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. Now, there are allegorical passages in the Bible. There's no doubt about that. But when we're looking at allegory or something, 
we have to see the, the genre of that literature and how it is interpreted. So, for example, if you read the book of Revelation, it's very clear when it mentions stars, it's allegorical. It mentions that these stars represent certain things. So you give an indication of where to interpret literally, uh, allegorically. But we're not getting that in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. In Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, it's a whole compendium of a book, a solid book, on, on, the, on the history of humanity. We have uh, the history of Adam's sin. We see uh, Cain and Abel, where murder comes in. We see about uh, Noah, where man as, as continues to rebel against God. The Tower of Babel, where man continues to rebel against God. It's quite clearly a compendium of history, and we see the life of Mo, uh, the life of Abraham, the life of Isaac, the life of Jacob, and the life of Joseph, and 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 the whole is a thread of history, a history of redemption, and there's no indication there that that is metaphorical. Not once did Bob give any detailed evidence for evolution. He 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 he, he kind of uh, said, "Do you believe in a young Earth then?" Do you believe the Earth is only 6,000 years? Know. Hold on. If you're going to be, if you're going to be, if you're going to, I don't know. Hold on one second. Time if you're going to be consistent to your own logic, you have to believe in a young Earth. I'm just saying. It says. Has, the Do Bible you believe in a flat a, Earth? I don't know about a lot of these things. Honestly, I'm, right, if but, I'm being honest, I don't know. Uh, no, and that's fine. Tried, but what I'm saying is, if you're going to be literal mm -hmm. about the Bible, mm -hmm. you have to believe in a flat Earth and you have to believe in a young Earth, and both of those positions are totally untenable. Now, I want to qualify evolution. Evolution on a macro and a micro level. The evolution on a macro level is not the same as evolution on a micro level. The micro level, a rabbit can change into a bigger rabbit. No argument about that. A rabbit can change into a black rabbit, a blue rabbit, a green rabbit, whatever color rabbit you want. And a rabbit can be a big rabbit, a small rabbit. So that's micro evolution. Nobody argues against that. Everybody agrees with that. But when you're talking about macro evolution, when you're talking that a rabbit one day in billions of years a rabbit could move to be a giraffe or I'm just being silly now but I'm just saying then that's a different matter that that is something that we need that that, that we need to get down to nitty-gritty and and ask for your detailed evidence what evidence Bob do you have for macroevolution however if you look at Richard Dawkins books uh, if you read uh, Richard Dawkins key books on evolution the blind watchmaker and uh, the one where he had all the pictures of the of evolution and it's a nice colorful book of the wonderful world or something I can't remember the name but if you if you look at the key books of Dawkins which I've looked at he makes the logic he makes uh, the logical fallacy of equivocation because the bats in the blind watchmaker he talks about the bats and he says uh, because the bats have developed this amazing sound system, therefore evolution could have taken place. In his wonderful uh, world book, uh, he, he looks at cabbages and cabbages change into th something else. And because he's observed that, he then says that if it can happen to cabbages, it can happen in the... Hit Just imagine if this was billions of years old, it, what would happen to the human, uh, to the creation if, if it was billions of years old. My challenge to you, uh, Bob, is what evidence have you got for evolution? And I'm on about macro evolution. You're not in your talks that you've done. You've done a couple now at Speaker's Corner. I challenge you to give us detailed evidence for macro evolution. Not, not browbeating people with these words. This is the words that Bob browbeats people with. This kind of biblical fundamentalism is creating an unnecessary obstacle to the gospel and it is holding the Christian community back because Christians are buying into conspiracy theories and they're buying into superstitions because of this kind of ignorance. What is a, what is a superstition is the idea that, you know, science can't be trusted. The reason why you have a mobile phone that works in your pocket no, no, no. is because science you know works. So he's browbeating his opponent by giving the idea that he's following science, they're not following science, but that that is just an argument from authority if you're not giving the flesh on the bone. So I'm challenging you, Bob. I'm challenging you. And here, before Soccer Films, before Speaker's Corner, I'm challenging you not just to brow people with the words, you, you're not following science. Give us some detailed 
evidence to prove macroevolution is a scientific fact. When we say something is, is a scientific fact, we're saying that it's probably 70% correct. That's what we mean by a fact, scientifically. Science works on probability. So my, my next question to you is, what is the probability of natural selection and mutation creating the complexity of the human eye? If, if you want to say, say that uh, theistic evolution, evolution uh, that, that God uh, moved evolution, evolution, then you need to ask the question, the question when you say God uh, created man through evolution, it, it is natural selection and mutation, is the mutation, is that haphazard or is that moved by God? Next question that I want to ask you is, is evolution science? Dr. May, who was one of the greatest evolutionists in the modern 20th century, said that it is a historical science. And now you can, you, in your video, you talked about the physics. Have you got a mobile phone? I have, yeah. Do you trust it? Right. Do you know the, no, what, what, do you know the theories? Do you know the theories that allow the satellites to move around the Earth? It's a, it's the use of the theory of relativity that allows a satellite to stay in orbit around the Earth that allows you to have signal on your phone. That's a completely different subject. So you did a logical fallacy there, Bob. We're not talking about physics. We're talking about biology, and specifically, as Dr. Mayer said, one of the greatest world authorities on evolution, who recently died a few years ago, said that evolution is a historical science. And if evolution is a historical science, that means you cannot observe in time macroevolution. So it's not the same as the physical sciences, like physics, for example. And, and that being the case, you cannot observe macroevolution. You cannot observe it over billions of years. That's why, and here's a question that I asked for you, Bob, is, is evolution a science? And if it is, could you give us your definition of what kind of science it is? Am I correct or incorrect in that macroevolution is a historical science? Are you disagreeing or agreeing with Dr. Mayer, who was a world authority on that, who recently died a few years ago, a top biologist who, who, who was not a creationist or involved in any, anything concerning Christianity in that sense? just a, a top scientist in his own field. The next question is, do you agree with Karl Popper? Karl Popper was the greatest philosopher of science in the 20th century. And my question to you, Bob, is this, is do you agree with him <clears throat> or disagree with him? Karl Popper, one of the greatest philosophers in science in the 20th century, said this, that, that evolution is not science. Karl Popper reneged on it. He said, Evolution is not science, then he reneged on it because there was cultural pressure upon him. But just before he died, he reneged on it. He actually acknowledged it near the end of his days that what he said, that evolution is not science, he, he, he said it's true, it's not science. And it's not truly science because it's a historical science. It's not a hard science. It's your interpretation of the past. It's not something you can demonstrate in the present. On the issue of, is it science, you keep saying that evolution is science, it's science, it's science. My argument to you is that Karl Popper, the greatest philosopher of science, said it was not science as we understand it. It's a, it's a particular interpretation of history. We have to be specific what we mean by science when we talk about evolution. Uh, studies, Bob. There have been studies been done concerning bacteria. Since 1980, bacteria has been multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. But in that multiplication of the bacteria, from 1980 to now, 40,000 generations, it's still bacteria, it's not changed. That 40,000 generations of bacteria comes to millions of years in the equiv in, uh, equivalent in human life. But yet the bacteria is still bacteria. So we have specific studies done on bacteria where bacteria is still bacteria when it's been multiplied over many thousands of generations. So have you got any specific hard data, Bob, to show macroevolution can take place in time, in observable time? Next question that I want to ask is information. 
in your DNA is information. In your DNA is information. It's a highly complex um, language within your DNA. How can the complex complexity of your DNA happen by pure chance? Now, you might say, well, uh, well, I believe in theistic evolution. God guided it. But you kind of want your cake and eat it. Because the whole point of natural selection and mutation is that there, there are these natural processes that are happening. And mutation is not a, a guided process. The actual mutation is a, a, fl a, a flick of the dice. So are you saying that God plays dice and in that dice he was able to make the complexity of the DNA? Well, why not just say God didn't play dice but God actually created Adam and Eve and within Adam and Eve it, there was already the complexity of the of the language in of of, of and the code in the DNA already there it, that makes more sense so my question to you then is the the complexity of DNA the the language the code within DNA it makes more sense to believe in a creator created man with the full complexity of the DNA than the DNA being created by natural selection and mutation and the mutation process being a flip of the dice. So can you explain the complexity of the DNA, the code within the human body? The other issue is the implications of evolution. Julian Huxley, the great grandson of Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog boasted, in the evolutionary system of thought there is no longer need or room for the supernatural. The earth was not created, it evolved. So did all the animals and plants that inhabited it, including our human cells, mind and soul, as well as brain and body. So did religion. Julian Huxley is here is, is, is saying that, look, evolution is a way of explaining away God. And you come along, and theistic evolutionists come along, and people like Biologus, N.T. Wright, and these sophisticated theologians, and basically... You don't fool anybody because those secularists know that if you accept evolution using God, God theistic evolution, they're, they'll, they'll be happy about that because they'll know that Christianity has been destroyed at the very foundation. Because the very core of evolution is saying God is not needed, that things just happen, uh, there's this process that happens, biological process, and God is not needed. But then you put God in. And from the secularist point of view, they're just going to see it as special pleading. They're not going to see it as intellectually credible. And a lot of people like yourself, Bob, and you've even said it to me. You've actually said it to me. There are intelligent people who can't well, accept creation, six-day creation. So for their sake, it's good and better to talk about this issue of theistic evolution. Now you didn't say it in those words, but that's what you were basically saying to me. So basically you're saying, look, culturally it doesn't have any intellectual credibility this six day creation, but people are going to listen if I say theistic evolution. But my point to you is, Julian Huxley is saying here that if you believe in evolution, there's no need for God. And if you say that God uh, did evolution, that started evolution and, and guides evolution, I'm not saying you actually say that, but you believe that evolution is correct, macroevolution. Then the secularists are just going to be laughing in your face. They're going to think, yeah, well, we've won here, because they know that the whole foundation of Christianity will collapse. So I, think, I don't think you realize, Bob, that you're actually undermining Christianity. You're not defending Christianity. You're actually undermining it. You're actually bringing it down before the secularists. You're actually harming the church, the Christian church. You're not defending it and making it intellectually credible. You're actually attacking the very foundation of the Christian faith. Because the Christian faith is based on a literal fall, a literal fall of Adam. Sin literally came in. It, it is based on God as the creator made man and creation. The sovereignty of God is that he created the world supernaturally. That is his sovereignty. The, the, one of the reasons why N.T. Wright, the Biologos people, people like Bob, go for theistic, theistic evolution is they're highly intelligent people. Bob's highly intelligent. 
He's a very smart guy. People like N.T. Wright are very smart. And they know if they go into the academic world, if they go into the academic world, they'll be laughed at. If they believe in six-day creation, they're just going to be laughed at. So in order for them to feel like, oh, no, to get a hearing, they acquiescence, they just accept evolution as a fact. In, uh, and, but then tag God on the end and say God did it so that they can get a hearing about Christianity. But the reality is what happens is they're actually undermining the faith. When you say, Bob, that when my brother quoted the history of, I think it was Luke. The Gospel of Luke is going back, to, obviously the Jews knew Adam as the first man. Yeah. That's what they believed. Right. And the Gospel originally first went to the Jews, didn't it? Right. So if, if the Gospel of Luke is going all the way back to Adam, yep. his, his sons Cain and Abel, really yeah. naming yeah. everyone one yeah. by one, yeah. all the way back yeah. to, to Adam, you know, that's, when, that's when the problem came to me. So No, I'm sorry, but Oregon read the Bible, St. Augustine read the Bible, and they didn't go for a literal interpretation of Genesis. Mm. You've kind of just undermined the Christian faith because, like the brother was saying, it's a genealogy that is seen to be historically true from the Christian perspective. Jesus' genealogy can be traced right back. And you're saying, no, 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 the, the last few bits of the genealogy is myth. There's, there's truths around it, but it's still myth. You've actually undermined the Christian faith, brother, and done a lot of damage. And not, not a lot of damage. You've done horrendous damage to the church because you're undermining the doctrine of sin, which then undermines the need for Christ to come and take away our sin. It's, it's strategically catastrophic what you're doing, brother. There's a famous atheist called Thunderfoot, and he made this statement that if Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is not literal, then Jesus died for an avatar. In other words, you're saying it's myth, with a little bit of historical truth here and there, but generally it's myth. Adam was not a real person. Basically, Jesus died for an avatar. What your the, even Thunderfoot and atheist understands the disaster it is to say that Genesis one, two, and three is not historical, literally historical. It's a complete disaster for Christianity, theologically speaking. Page twenty four of this book. Thomas Huxley using this argument of races beating other races, the survival of races above other races. Thomas Huxley said this, No rational man, concise of the facts, believes that the average Negro is equal, still less the superior of the white man. It's simply incredible to think that he will be able to compete successfully with his bigger brain and smaller jawed rival in a contest which is to be carried on by thought and not by bite. So my next question is, how do you square evolution with the doctrine of Christ? The doctrine of love your neighbor as yourself, when evolution is about the survival of the fittest. How do you equate the two? How do you square the logical inconsistency? As H.F. Osborne, director of the American Museum of National History and one of the most prominent American anthropologists of the first half of the 20th century put it, the Negroid stock is even more ancient than the Corsican and the Mongolian and may be proved by an examination not only of the brain, of the hair, of the bodily characters such as the teeth, the genitalia and the sense organs but of the instincts, the intelligence. The standard of intelligence of the average adult Negro is similar to that of the 11 year old youth of the species of Homo sapiens. So here is a director of the American Museum H.F. Osborne using evolution and is, is making unwittingly racist remarks about black people because the idea of the survival of the fittest, people have developed higher than other, other, other groups. For evolution to succeed, it is crucial that the unfit die as the fittest survive. Marvin Lubino graphically portrays the ghastly consequences of such belief in his book, Bones of Contention. So the bone of contention, if the unfit survived indefinitely, they would continue to infect the fit in their less fit genes. The result is that the more fit genes would be diluted and comprised by the less fit genes. And evolution could not take place. The concept of evolution demands death. The Bible teaches that death is a foreigner, a condition superimposed upon humans and nature after creation. If you believe in evolution, evolu that death is natural. Whereas in the Christian faith, death is not natural. 
death came in because of a tragedy, because of the fall of man. Adam fell and it was a tragedy and death is a tragedy. Whereas if you believe in evolution, evolution is a natural thing. So how do you square that, Bob? Out of Hitler's philosophy that the Jews were subhuman, that Aryans were sub supermen, led to the extermination of six million Jews. In the words of Sir Arthur Keith, a militant and anti-Christian physical anthropologist, the German Führer, as I have consistently maintained, is an evolutionist. He has consistently sought to make the practices of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. That is um, page 28 in this book. Karl Marx, the father of communism, saw in Darwinianism the scientific and sociological support of an economic experiment that eclipsed even the carnage of Hitler's Germany. His hatred of Christianity and Christi Christ, Christ and Christianity led to the mass murder of multiple millions worldwide. Karl Marx saw revered Darwin that his desire was to dedicate a portion of Das Kapital to him. So the communists and through Karl Marx were influenced by evolution led to the extermination of many Christians. Sigmund Freud, the founder of modern psychology, was also a faithful follower of Charles Darwin. His belief that man was merely a sophisticated animal led him to postulate that mental disorders were the vestiges of behavior that had been appropriated earlier in stages of evolution. Daniel Goleman points out that evolutionary idea that Freud relied on is the maxim that ontogenity recapitulates phylogeny. That is that the development of the individual recapitulates the evolution of the entire species. This notion which I refute in chapter 6 supposes that conceptus at one stage is a fish rather than a fetus from the Latin for infant as is thus expendable. The human carnage that has resulted from this evolutionary dogma has eclipsed the atrocities of Hitler and Marx combined. So Sigmund Freud and modern psychology is rooted in evolutionary ideas. And if you know about the history of psychology with Sigmund Freud, it undermined the whole concept of Christian marriage and Christian sex. So that, that, that's some of the implications of evolution on a sociological, political, moral foundation that if you believe in evolution and you believe you believe that and you you, you tag God tag God on it you still got these uh, ethical issues that you need to answer but that it, it, it kind of messes Christianity up um, and, 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 and has led to the persecution of Christianity on many many levels so you need to answer that question the next thing I want to read is uh, the Confession of Faith by A. A. Hodge. It pleased God that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness in the beginning to create and make of nothing the world and all things therein, whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days, all very good. So that is the Catechism, the Westminster Confession of Faith, 1600, saying that creation was in six days. But then it says, section 2, after God had made all other creatures, he created man male and female with reasonable and immortal souls, endued with knowledge, righteousness and true holiness after his own image, having the law of God written in their hearts and power to fulfill it. <clears throat> Yet under the possibility of transgressing, being left to the liberty of their own will, which were in subject to change. Beside this law written in their hearts, they received a command not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which while they kept, they were happy in the communion with God and had dominion over the creatures. So here is the Westminster Confession of Faith saying us that six day creation and saying that Adam and Eve were literal people and that it's important to understand concerning the doctrine of sin. This is in the Westminster Confession of Faith. So my question to you here, Bob, is how do you deal with the great confessions of faith? You, you, you claim to be a person looking at the history of the church, following the history of the church, well, here's the Westminster Confession, and I'm sure if you go back even further into more ancient times, there will be the same teaching as this concerning creation in the Articles of Faith. So that is the Westminster Confession. Now, why does the Westminster Confession say this? Well, the Westminster Confessionists, when they wrote this, many of them were great minds. Many of them trained at Oxford and Cambridge. Many of them had great minds in philosophy. And in, at the time this confession was written, there were people called deists. 
And these deists believe that that you can know God by nature, okay? And what the what the confession is saying that yeah, nature does show us God. Uh, God created it, but also Revelation tells us about Adam and Eve and the fall of man. So this issue of God is creator was important to the confession and grounding it in Revelation that Adam and Eve sinned. Let's go to Hebrews 1 verse 2. Hebrews 1 verse 2. As in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he made the worlds. Verse 3. Who being in the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. That God created everything is, is showing that God is sovereign, that God has the right to be worshipped, that God has the right to, to be honoured. John chapter 1 verse 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word God. He was in the beginning with God. All things, verse 3, John 1 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So this doctrine of creation, that God created things in six days, it, it, it's important in this, is that it's, a, it, it, it's showing that God is sovereign, that God has the right to be honoured, that God has the right to be worshipped, that God can call men to repentance and believe. If you read in Acts chapter 17, where it talks about Paul goes to Aragopagus, the philosophers, and he talks about, he says, you know there's a God, you know there's an unknown God, you know that God's created everything. So creation, that is showing that, the doctrine of creation is showing that it's God who has the sovereign right to be worshipped because he's the one that created everything. But as soon as you connect God to evolution, you're taking away his glory. You're taking away his rights because you're saying that it didn't create, but it wasn't created by God. That he, he did a bit, but then the rest of it was done by evolution. Uh, Romans 1.20 For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So men cannot say that there is no God. Men cannot say they don't have to worship God. Because God made everything. God made man, he made creation. So man has to worship God and honor God. And if you slap in theistic evolution, you say theistic evolution is true, then the complexity of all this creation and the wonder and the beauty of it is down to macroevolution and not to God. And men can say, we don't have to worship this God. And this video is a public, gentle, but clear, unequivocal rebuke and challenge to you brother that what you're teaching in this area is theologically dangerous and disastrous now on the issue of the age of the earth i think once you get past three five thousand years personally i think that anybody who says that they know what happened in five thousand years ago i think people have to be very very careful so when you're saying you know what happened billions of years ago, I think you're in the realms of ridiculous. You're in the realms of, of craziness, you know. I think one has to have a, a modicum of humility when we're talking about so far in the past. I don't have to prove anything. So long as my plausibility structure is sound, then I don't have to prove every point in that structure. And my plausibility structure is, number one, uh, God created the world. There's evidence for that. There's order in the universe. Number two, uh, Adam was a real person. There's evidence for that because there is evil in the world and the fall explains evil. So my plausibility structure is correct. And the history of the human race, there's lots of evidence for the history of Israel. There's lots of evidence for who Jesus is and he died and rise again. So my plausibility structure as a Christian is sound. I don't have to have all the answers. I don't have to capitulate to modern uh, theories of, of evolution. If evolution is science, why is it that evolutionists are political with evolution? Why is it that evolutionists don't allow free freedom of thought concerning evolution? For example, Bob, the Samothian Institute, there, uh, the Samothian Institute, there was a scientist there wanted to promote debate on intelligent design. He, he, he got a paper published in the magazine that he was editor of. And this scientist published this paper of Mayer, Dr. Meyer, I think it was, 
and uh, he lost his job for doing that, promoting intelligent design debate. And a number of scientists have lost their jobs when they try to promote intelligent, intelligent design debate. My question to you, Bob, is if evolution is science, why don't they allow proper freedom of speech? The language that Richard Dawkins used against Michael B is absolutely disgusting. The way, Mike, the way Michael B was treated over the years by Richard Dawkins is tantamount to hate speech. And so my question to you is, why is it people like Richard Dawkins are so militant with evolution? Because they don't allow you to, to, <coughs> to challenge them with any other scientific information. Other information, a lot of the key components of trying to convince people about evolution, the peppered moth, the, the bones that have been discovered, the pit down man and many others, many of these have been shown to, to not be correct. For example, in all the schools when I was growing up, we had books that showed the peppered moth, the black moth, or the white moth, and that this was a proof of evolution. They were hoaxes. They weren't proof of evolution. They actually stuck the peppered moth on trees with pins and took photographs of them. And then they continued to publish these in, in, the, in the school books and never changed. Even today, they're still used. But they don't prove evolution, and, and they were hoaxes the way they did it. Look up the book Zombie Science. Zombie Science on Discovering Institute to show you how a lot of these educational books that have been written over the years have falsified information when they're teaching evolution. That's just one example with the peppered moth. So if evolution is science, why did they propagate false information in the textbooks? Why is it they don't promote proper debate and discussion uh, in, in the academic realm. If you are a scientist and you question evolution from any other particular point of view, you will lose your job, you will lose uh, your professorship, your department, your research money, etc. So that's a lot of what I've got to say. I provided some evidence for creation. I've provided hermeneutical evidence for creation. I provided theological and moral arguments against evolution and it's over to you Bob. You're not saving the church, you're not helping the church, you're actually endangering the church because you're having a lot of influence at the moment and you're endangering the church because people are listening to what you're saying, they're hearing what you're saying and they're taking on, they'll take on board this theistic evolution and what you're saying sounds plausible but when we actually look at it and, and, and deconstruct it, it's dangerous what you're saying. So please, brother, be more careful. Read good books and think more deeply on this topic because the way you're going about it is dangerous. It's really, really dangerous to deny the fall of man. The literal fall of man in Adam is devastatingly dangerous to the Christian faith. However way you spin it, it's dangerous. So I'm asking you to at least pick up some of the points that I've said. If you want to debate me, I'm happy to debate, but I'm in Ghana and my internet's not fantastic. So God bless you and uh, take care. God bless. If you want to debate me, I'm happy to debate, but I'm in Ghana and my internet's not fantastic. So God bless you and uh, take care. God bless. <laughs>